grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for today comes to us from Malachi chapter 4. The day is coming, that great and awesome day of the Lord. Some translations render it as the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is the day of judgment. And it is the day of grace and salvation. And in a sense, that day has already come. With the incarnation of Christ and his death on the cross. For on that day, judgment was rendered, and Satan was found defeated. No longer may he stand in the heavenly places to accuse us of all the things that we have done, that we know we have done, and even those sins of which we are unaware. His mouth is silenced because Christ Jesus has paid the price. In his death, he has reconciled you to God. He has purchased and won you from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil. Everything that was necessary, everything that the law demanded, has been fulfilled. And so grace, grace now reigns. But the promised judgment in Malachi, that great and awesome day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, when he comes with glory to judge both the living and the dead, that day is yet to come. For the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience are meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For those who refuse to hear the word of the Lord, whose hearts are not hear the preaching of the law, the gospel is of no worth, of no effect. It is, for many, sadly, foolishness, superstition, or the opiate of the masses. And for whom is wrath being stored up? Malachi describes it as the arrogant and the evildoers. He says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble." The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This wrath of God is described as burning like an oven, a place so hot that nothing will be left. It will leave them neither root nor branch. And such is the judgment of God, that all who fall under it are utterly destroyed. Left without a heritage, without a root, and left with no offspring, with no branch, there is absolutely nothing left of them but the destruction. And this burning we know is hell, but it is not a quick and simple end. It is a burning, a destruction that carries on for eternity. But who would be these 
arrogant ones. What is it that Malachi is talking about? If we look to the contrast of the blessing that Malachi speaks, of those who fear God's name, in this case we know something of those arrogant ones. They are unbelievers. And what could be any more arrogant than to dismiss God, to disregard your Creator, the Lord Almighty, who daily and richly provides all that you need for this body and life. The arrogant think that they can make it on their own, that they know better than God how to live, that they can take all good from His hand, and then disregard him as if there was nothing that he could do about it. And that is true arrogance. That is unbelief. What unbelief thinks, what unbelief does. And there are, sadly, Christians who have fallen to this kind of arrogance. Christians who do not take the time to know God. Christians who cannot spare an hour or two out of the 168 hours of the week to come unto His holy house and worship and confess His holy name. Christians who demand the right to live their lives any way they want. That God should not intrude on them or their families should not disrupt their plans, that he has no right to tell them what is right or wrong. Or Christians who reserve unto themselves judgment about what is good and what is evil and how exactly God should deal with sinners. All these have rejected God's word and have in place enshrined words of their own. But what of that other group? What of the evildoers? They're not exactly a distinct or different group, but they're, they're part of these ones who are called ignorant. But they are set aside because there is something fundamentally different. They are the ones who deliberately do evil, who make the choice, who even knowing better, turn from what is good and choose to do what is wicked. St. John writes, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as Christ is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. These are the ones whose practice whose habit, whose very default being is to lie, to cheat, to steal, to take advantage of the poor and the helpless, to lead astray the weak and the vulnerable. And there are many evildoers in the world, terrorists and murderers, swindlers and scam artists and thieves, drug dealers and gangbangers, pornographers, abortionists, and those who condemn their children to death. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not enter or inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But take note, I am talking about those who do these things, not those who have done these things. I'm speaking of those who live according to their arrogance, not those who have ever been arrogant. For there is yet room for forgiveness. 
For we were once all evildoers. Once we all walked in arrogance. And though we still struggle with sin, brothers and sisters, we are no longer slaves to that sin. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. For all who fear the name of the Lord, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing, in its wings. Judgment Day will be a day of healing and joy, a day of victory and peace. And on that day, at the resurrection of all flesh, our bodies will be transformed and made glorious like the glorious body of the resurrected Christ. And with the sinful flesh now fallen away, so also will and all impediments of sin. No more pain. No more sickness. No more sorrow. No more death. To be certain, your salvation has already been accomplished. The work is done. The victory secure. And you have been redeemed. Purchased and won from all sin from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with Christ's holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. Signed, sealed, and delivered were you in the waters of holy baptism. And today you'll receive a guarantee the true body and the most precious blood of Christ Jesus in with and under the bread and wine these are simple common elements we behold as the very son of God and he is there not because I say so and not because we think it is so he is there because he has said so he has promised it, and his word makes it happen. And it is his will that we live in healing and joy and peace. And that's cause to celebrate. And so let us celebrate by, by hearing his word. And let us celebrate by singing his praises. And let us celebrate as living, as redeemed children of the Heavenly Father. For so indeed you truly are. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.